Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Now is the time to trim your lamps and get ready for the coming of the Lord. Stay tuned for the Midnight Cry broadcast. I had a verse uh, come to me several, several times earlier this week and then just continually coming back to me. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and use it as a focus the things I believe the Lord wants to use to encourage us. It's found in Isaiah 42. I'm going to go ahead and just read the passage and try not to get bogged down in getting to where I want to get. Um, but this was one of many prophecies that God had given to people in the Old Testament. And, uh, you know, we know from, from Peter's writings, on, on the one hand, nobody who prophesied like this and it's recorded for us did that because it was their own idea, their own interpretation. It was something that God overshadowed them to give. We also know that they didn't understand what they were prophesying. They just knew it was for something, somebody down the road and it would all be fulfilled in its proper time. And so uh, this was one of those prophecies, you know, people think they can unravel this with a natural mind. You can't do it. God has to un unlock his word. You remember how the disciples even had no clue what was going on until he opened their understanding to see what, was, what the scriptures were really talking about in the Old Testament and how they were pointing to what we're experiencing today. So anyway, let's just go ahead and read uh, beginning in verse 1. Here is my servant whom I uphold. Now, uh, this is, I think it's clear as you go along, this is, this is the Lord, this is the Father talking, and he's talking about his son who would be, who would be coming to earth. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice." He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. This is what the Lord says, the Lord, God the Lord says, the creator of the heavens who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness, I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will, and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. See, none of this was just about the Jews, was it? Always God's purpose was to work through them to ultimately reach everyone and, make, and bring forth one covenant. Praise God. To open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the ends of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it. You islands and all who live in them. Let the wilderness and its towns raise their voices. Let the settlements where Kedar lives rejoice. Let, all, let the people of Selah sing for joy. Let them shout from the mountaintops. Let them give glory to the Lord and proclaim his praise in the islands. The Lord will march out like a champion. Like a warrior, he will stir up his zeal. With a shout, he will raise the battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. Well, he did, didn't he? <laughs> praise God. For a long time I have kept silent. I have been quiet and held myself back. But now, like a woman in childbirth, I cry out, I gasp and pant. I will lay waste the mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will turn rivers into islands and dry up the pools. Now, this is, this is the verse that, that kept coming back to me. I will lead the blind by ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. These are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. Praise God. What an awesome promise that is. 
And think about what the Lord is, was prophesying from a time where it was dark and the, the nation of Israel was certainly uh, no one to be, you know, looking at and saying, wow, aren't they wonderful? It was, a, it was a small remnant that kept serving God. In fact, you know, this book begins with, except the Lord had, had kept us a small remnant, very small remnant, we would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. I tell you, God has a way of preserving His plan and His people in every age. And that certainly is something we need to focus on right now because we're in a very uncertain time, aren't we? But I thank God for His promises. And these promises, we're looking forward to the era of, of Christ's coming and all that was to follow. And it wasn't just, uh, you know, it, it wasn't just the beginning and, and a, great, a great beginning. This was something that was going to continue all the way to the end. He was going to finish what he started, basically, is what he's saying. But there's an awesome promise here in verse 16. I will lead the blind, begins, I will lead the blind by ways they have not known. And I've sort of gone back and forth in my mind as to how to, how to unpack this. But I think I'm going to begin with the object of this promise. Who is he talking about here? When he's talking about the blind, who is he talking about? Now, how many of you uh, have a perfect understanding of all that's going to happen, all that's coming? You know, God, you know the ins and outs of God's plan, and uh, you can foresee your life going forward. You know all that. No, none of us, none of us in that position. The reality is that we as people are part of a prison planet, a planet that Satan, the God of this world, where he has blinded the minds of men. We are blind. We just simply do not know. And the, and the question is here, what kind of blindness is he talking about? My, my mind also went back to a scripture uh, that's at the end of John chapter 9, I believe it is. This was an occasion when Jesus had healed a man who had been born blind. And so they were, uh, the religious leaders were trying to figure out what happened. What's this all about? I don't get this. And arguing with him, debating with him, is, was he, were you really blind? You know, going on and on and on. Finally, the guy gets exasperated with him and says, now we know that God doesn't listen to sinners uh, and, and he goes on and, and just basically says that this authenticates who Jesus is. This is a man of God. And they threw him out. They got him out of there. So you had people who were absolutely resistant to the ministry of Jesus. It didn't matter what he did. They weren't going to believe. This was, a, this was a problem of will, wasn't it? Okay. So then the man encounters Jesus again. I guess uh, G Jesus found him. And then, do you believe in the Son of Man? Verse 35. And who is he, sir? The man asked, tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. So there was a, there was a real turnabout in every way in this man's life. But there's an interesting statement that Jesus makes in verse 39 that I believe reflects what we've been reading in Isaiah 42, because you, in Isaiah 42, you have a promise of some wonderful blessings that are going to flow, of a plan that's going to unfold, but also of judgment. It's obvious there are opposers, there are enemies to what God has set out to do. And so Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. You know, when, God, when Jesus comes, when the Word of God comes to people, it makes, a, it makes a separation, doesn't it? It always creates a separation. There are some who bow to it. There are some who say, yes. Uh, and, and then there are others who will say, no. And they, harden, they harden their hearts to it. So the, the, there were a couple of Pharisees. There were some Pharisees who were with him, heard him say this, and asked, what? Are we blind too? And here's a verse that I believe unlocks something about what, what Isaiah 42 meant when it talks about the blind that he was going to lead. If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin, but now you claim, now that you claim you can see your guilt remains. So what you have is a case of people who were spiritually blind. But then it comes along a light from God, a voice from God that, that tries to expose their condition 
and tr- wants to open their eyes and they say, no, I refuse. I can see just fine. You see, there's a problem not of ability to see, but of will. You know, imagine you were, you were uh, walking along and you saw a blind man walking toward a cliff. And in compassion, you walked up to him and tried to stop him and tried to warn him and say, there's a cliff coming. I can see it and you can't. Listen to me. What if he said, get away and leave me alone. I see just fine. I know where I'm going. Is that not a pretty good picture of the world that we're living in? That's the condition. So this blindness that we're talking about comes down to a place of will. When the, when the gospel comes to you and to me, one of the things that it does is to expose our true condition of need. But human nature doesn't like that. Human nature does not want to admit that we are people of need and that we cannot chart our own, we're not capable of charting our own course, we're not capable of fulfilling God's plan. In every sense, we are dependent upon God his, and His mercy. There's not one thing we can do to qualify ourselves for anything that He has. So do you begin to see what, what the Lord is talking about in Isaiah 42 when He's talking about a promise to lead the blind? Folks, I think the further you go, if you're listening to the Lord and you're, and you're learning from Him The more we go, the more we come to a place where we realize, Lord, I am blind. I don't know. I don't know half the stuff I think I know. Lord, I need you. I need you to lead me. I'm in a place where I can. It's not like you can just tell me, here's where I want you to go now. Work up a plan and get there. This is not the way it works. The people that God leads are people who surrender, people who willingly recognize their need to be led. Oh, God. You know, you think about Abraham as a perfect example there in in so many ways, the father of faith. Here's a man that, that God spoke to. And he gave him a vision. It's true, sometimes the Lord can tell us where we're going, but, what, but, but getting there is a different matter. He never says, work up your five-year plan and let's see how it works out. You know, you can get there. Use, use all these natural abilities I've given you. You can, you can fulfill that. No, there, is, there was a vision that God gave to Abraham, was there not? Leave your father's house, leave your family, leave your country, and go to a land that I will show you. And there was a promise of God, there is a land, but, but the Lord did not turn Abraham loose to just do, do his thing and, you know, like, go find it. The Lord had to lead him step by step. And so, the, and so there was a faith in Abraham toward this God who had spoken to him. And so he was willing to, to do what the Lord said, to leave, to go, and God led him step by step by step and unfolded the promises that we are still experiencing the benefit of today because it was in his seed that all nations of the world would be blessed. We're some of that. We're some of the result of Abraham believing God and trusting him and being willing to take that place where he didn't know what to do. You know, that's something that we need. The further I go, the more I realize how much I, how desperately I need the Lord to lead me. This isn't just personal. This is the church. Do we know what to do? Do we really need, know what to do? We're in an uncertain world. We don't know what's coming tomorrow. We, folks, we need the Lord. And we need to have that sense that we, that, that the Lord, that we need the Lord. You know, the Psalms tells us, don't be like the, like the horse and the mule. Well, how do you lead a horse and a mule? You got to put a bit in their mouth and beat them. You got you to do something physical to make them go the way you want them to go. You can't just explain, hey, this is where I want you to go. 
We need the Lord, and we need to have a heart that agrees with this. How many of you have known the Lord long enough, you, you see the difference between being like Peter when he was young, do, running and doing things in his own zeal, and coming to a place where he just think, oh, God, I don't know. I don't even necessarily want to go anywhere, but Lord, you, I'm in your hands. I'm just stretching forth. If, you, if there's anything going to happen, it has got to be you, Lord. But do you know that's, that's something we need to learn? We need to have that as a people. We need to be a people who say, God, we don't know what to do. We don't know where to go. We don't know the future. But our place is to lift up our hearts and say, oh, God, we are trusting in you. When it comes to the things that, that are eternal, we are blind and we need a leader. We need someone to show us the way. Oh, God, help us. And, you know, you could sort of come to a place where you recognize, I just can't manage my life. I don't know what to do. Okay, Lord, I guess I'll trust you. You could do that almost with a grudging spirit. But I'll tell you that what the, I believe the Lord wants. If we see Him, if we see things as they really are, shouldn't we come to a place not just of resignation, but a place of joy and rest and peace? where we say, oh, Lord, what a privilege I have to be in that place that's safe. What a privilege I have to know somebody who cares about me like you've demonstrated you care. Lord, I don't know the way, and you do. And so I just, I am resting. I, I, I embrace the reality of my own blindness and inability. I'm glad you know, it's like Paul who, who came to, had to deal with that with his weakness. We've used the scripture many times where he came to a point where he gloried in his weakness. Well, we can glory in our blindness too in this sense. There is an opening of our eyes to see things the world doesn't see, but in terms of can I lead myself? Can I go forward? Do I have the, all that it takes to do what I'm supposed to do? No, I need him step by step to lead me. And I embrace that with all of my heart. That's who he's talking about in Isaiah 42. Isn't it interesting? When you come to the end of chapter 9, it goes right into chapter 10. How many of you know there were no chapters and no verses in when John wrote this? So this simply moves straight into Jesus talking about the shepherd and the sheep. Well, of course, we know that sheep are very self-reliant, very strong, able to lead. No, sheep are very, well, we use, we've often used the word stupid, but steep, sheep are very dependent creatures. And so where he's talking, he's just been talking about a willful blindness on the part of these religious leaders. Now he comes and he talks about a peop, his people, his sheep, who know his voice. The Father has, has uh, you know, made them secure in Christ and in himself. He goes on, he talks about all these things in the, in the process. My sheep know my voice, they hear me, they, go, they follow me where I go. I want to be one of the, I want to be that. I want to, that's what God is, God's word comes and it makes a separation. But this is, this is, the people that are on the right side of this are the people who say, yes, Lord, that's me. I'm willing to lay down my pride, my self-sufficiency, all of this I can do it kind of spirit in a, in a wrong sense. Lord, you are my sufficiency. Folks, I need the Lord. I'm glad to acknowledge that I can do nothing without him. And I believe that's, the, that's the, what he's looking for from, the, from his people, to bring us to that place where we not only recognize our need but there's a joyfulness and a restfulness in doing it. So anyway, let's go back to Isaiah 42. The first word in that promise is I. So, you know, it's a pretty good idea to stop and say, well, now, who is this that's making this promise? Is he somebody who can do what he says he's going to do? And I think it's pretty plain that he is. <laughs> you, go, you go back through the passage and you see... Uh, all this, I am the Lord, verse, verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another. See, the former things have taken place, and new things I declare. Before they happen, 
you know, I announced them, but he talks about, I am the creator. This is what the Lord God says, verse, in, verse 5, the creator of the heavens who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. This is somebody who, this is the ultimate source of all. This is the God of the universe who is making this promise, not just in some vague general sense. He's making this promise to you and you and you and you and me this morning. I've sensed this in my own heart, the Lord wanting me to come to a greater place where every issue of life I can put in his hands. And there are times when, yeah, he wants me to step out, but he can let me know that. But there are other times he wants me to just put issues in his hands and not struggle and strive and plan and work and, and do all the things that we do to try to run our own lives. We just come to a place to recognize that this, is, this God has promised to lead me. This has been the Midnight Cry broadcast. If you would like a DVD or CD of today's message in its entirety, please request it by program number. While it is not required, a donation of $10 for DVDs and $5 for CDs is suggested to help with expenses. Also, for those who request it, we will send you our quarterly publication, The Midnight Cry Messenger, free and postage paid. Send your requests to Midnight Cry Ministries, Post Office Box 685, Southern Pines, North Carolina, 28388. We invite you to join us again next week at the same time, and may God richly bless you until then.